beautiful. What, yep. a, what a way to start. <laughs> that's why that's why you get it all out before you push record. <laughs> and for no one with context, let's take that one out of context and, and use that <laughs> elsewhere. Yep. Be yep. fun. Okay, uh, being healthy and sustainable. <laughs> Being healthy and sustainable. This this was brought up by myself a couple of weeks back. And my thinking around this was how health is somewhat subjective with some objective measures in there. Uh, but what we what we see as health from ourselves and what we see as health on social media and what everyone else talks about and guides and pushes don't always match. There's not always a, an agreement in the advice given because we're all different. Some of us have parents to deal with, uh, so sleeping nine hours isn't always possible. <laughs> uh, and, and food, sometimes people don't have the time to cook um, and do all of this. <laughs> what was that? Don't I know it. That was me and me. <laughs> you have kids. Yeah, not that nine hours, I'd be lucky. Food. Yeah, I have time. Yeah. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah i mean i've watched a it's funny i watched a film yesterday on netflix with a family it's called fatherhood and I, I was watching it like oh this is funny but this is also like what actually happens mm, mm, right well um yeah let's 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 pause that one for a bit shall we <laughs> that's a lot of effort so obviously being healthy and being sustainable at least you can pause that's true. <laughs> no. uh, it's, it's, it's obviously it's obviously challenging for different people. So I thought we'd have a, a discussion around what what the guidelines are and what we could actually do. Because what we do is different to what we're told to do. Oh yes. Oh yes. So I, I, I kind of want to push it over to you a little bit with like your experience, obviously. You, you've had a couple of kids uh, and you've you've gone through some health changes and sustainability challenges um so i'll sort of give you the floor for a minute and see what this is what a very changed. nice floor this is a very nice floor thank you very much um so <laughs> lovely yeah so health has always been a weird one there's a lot of pressure in a way, the way you should be healthy, the things you should do and how you should work and how you should be. And for me, I've never been very motivated by like just being healthy. That was never enough. No, I don't want to die. Of course not. I want to stay moving for as long as possible. But it wasn't enough just like, well, you're going to die. You should exercise every single day. Otherwise, you're going to blah, 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 blah. And as someone with multiple health conditions, which are great and get in the way, it's it was always a fascinating conversation, especially when I started talking to you, because, of course, you come from the exact opposite side where you've learned how to effectively be an athlete so to speak i know it's different but you understand a lot more of that than i do and i have no interest in understanding it and if i want to understand something i will dive in as deep as possible um and i think about the only thing that has been that i did for my health was shift my diet and that was about all i've done and to be fair it's not the you know the most cleanest of diets at all but it keeps me going and I'm just trying to figure out ways of being a little bit more healthy. Because my problem is I went too far the other way. It was very funny. Um, like with exercise, like just being healthy, I didn't do very much. I'm quite sedentary most of the time, except I'm always moving. So I will be moving all the time, but I don't go out or I don't have special exercise time where I roll out a mat and do stupid shit that I just don't there's no motivation for me to do that but I will pace for hours and hours and hours on end and I think it was coming to terms with what was just enough was really important for me because with kids like I don't have all the time in the world and what do I want to do go down to the gym and spend hours in the gym well, that eats into my work time, which 
you know, it can do, and that's fine. And if I want to prioritize that, I could, I know that. But for me, I'm more interested in just getting what I need. I went to the gym, didn't find it fun, didn't enjoy it. I found no enjoyment, which was not motivating at all. And if I'm not motivated, it's not going to happen. I do not want to go down the gym for ages. Did I feel better when I did it? Yes. But it's not enough just to feel better. Um, it's just about me going, okay, so what can I r really do? What will I do sustainably instead of, ah, look at that. Um, what will I do that is sustainable for my health? Sustaining my health instead of just trying to get fit and lose weight. And I think often what's focused in the health industry is the concept of being broken. You're too fat. You're too this. You're too that. You don't eat enough. You don't eat, you eat too much. There's not really a, a balance. And that's what my idea of being healthy is. And we have sustainable on there as well because of the business part. It's about figuring out what was right. What was enough for me? Could I do more? Yes. When I want to do more, I'll do more. But when I don't, I'm not going to just spend all my time beating myself up about it. Will that mean I'm not going to be as healthy as I reach my older ages? Yeah, that that is that is the case. But or well, that could be the case. That is a risk, but honestly, yeah. There are, there are so many points in there where as a strength and conditioning, I'm not going to say professional because I don't practice strength and conditioning. I just research it and have done like a master's degree in it. Um, but like, there are so many points in there that really like, which kind of like resonate with me in the, the, the points you made are the reasons that I'm not in the field that I'm not practicing. Yeah. Because strength and conditioning is high performance. That's essentially what strength and conditioning coaches do. For those uh, abroad, strength and conditioning and PT, they're kind of like, they're, they're the same field, but they're different fields. Physiotherapy, personal training, strength and conditioning, they all essentially do the same thing, just typically directed at different people. And it's mainly the education that they get that separates the professions. Like, hey, I've got this certificate and you've got that certificate. I've done this research, you've done that research. That's basically the difference. Um, some having more, some having less, depending on the country, it, it changes with qualification. But all, all of those people try to get people to be active. But being active looks different for different people. And something that I found out, uh, what was it, second year uni? So I wasn't even doing strength and conditioning at this point. Um, the kind of, it blew my mind a little bit at the time, but it made me realize how much exercise you not necessarily don't need, but you could already be doing, is that if you walk a mile or you run a mile, you burn almost the exact same amount of calories. Um, and like you'd think, oh yeah, I need to run a mile because I burn. No, you don't. You don't. If you burn, if you run or you walk a mile, you're still going a mile. The only difference in calories expended um, is oxygen debt, which is minimal. The only Ooh. difference, the only real difference is running is quicker. <laughs> but running also puts more force on your on your limbs so if you've got bad knees or bad back or bad ankles running is harder that, that that's literally the difference um so when when you said oh yeah i'm pacing around you pacing backwards and forwards for an hour could be more than the person doing a 20 minute run every day because you could be walking further like distance wise than the person running because maybe they're running really slow or they they just don't run that far uh, or you sitting in your chair, moving around and swinging around and doing loads of stuff because you're a fidget ass like myself, you're burning loads of energy, just moving and sitting still, which is one of those things. It's called basal metabolic rate. Essentially it's Ooh. the rate. Yeah. Technical Ooh. terms. <laughs> essentially, Fancy. I know. I know. Um, but essentially it's how much energy you burn like in a day. Some people are static. They don't move. They just sit still and they do their work. Other people are fidgets and they move around loads and everything you do. So every movement you make is burning energy. So some people <laughs> burn loads more energy, just, just doing their stuff in their day because they're a fidget bum um, compared to someone else. <laughs> like, I love how you've gone from being like proper technical language to fidget bum. Yes. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Welcome to the high quality that you find on the Ocean Nets podcast. It's, it's, it's like trying to make it relatable, okay? Um, <laughs> I, so energy expenditure. Just... 
<laughs> it was interesting because something I realized recently. So I've been reading a book on my Kindle, um, and I always thought I had to sit down to read a book. Don't know why. It's just it's just what's commonly seen. And then I'm just I know you don't like reading at all, but like I literally was in my studio and I literally started pacing back and forward and just was reading and was enjoying the book far more, standing up, walking around. I had my Kindle, which is tiny and it's not very big, so I can. And it was so much more, I took more in because I was just going, okay, cool. I can walk around, I can pace, I process when I pace, I, it helps me to think. And I'm just like, okay, cool. So now I'm going to read by pacing around and walking around all the time because it just actually helps me to think about what I'm consuming. Often in the kind of PKM space, it's like, you know, taking notes and note taking and doing this and sitting down at your desk writing things down, writing your notes, putting these things here, putting these things there. And it's just like, it's, it's passive. It's incredibly passive in terms of actual movement, but active in terms of your brain. And so my, like my kind of conclusion recently is like, okay, cool. I want, I do want to move around more. I do care, but like, I am not going to just go out for a mile walk unless I have a point to it. I just can't like, oh, just go and explore where you are. I'm living in my hometown. I've already done that. <laughs> it's boring. I don't care. There's nothing here. I'm not interested. <laughs> and I don't like where I live anyway, so it's just a whole nother matter. It's like there's no motivation to do so. But the point, the the reason, the purpose of doing something, um, Need, it needs to be, it needs to be motivating to whoever it is like doing it because if i i personally go for a walk i listen to a podcast but i go for a walk because well, sometimes anyway um because it's good for my eyes um because yeah. i've got bad eyes um so it helps it helps my eyes with the vision and with my sight but it also depends on uh, like if you have issues with sleep it can help with circadian rhythms and cycles and stuff but it's one of those things that is it going to be a massive impact no not really it's just a, a small thing that could help uh, and that's what most exercise is it's a small thing that could help here and there but most people don't need it like if if you're living fine then don't you don't need to add something to the list like exercise isn't shouldn't be a, a chore it should be something you want to do yeah and that i think is something that i've recently come to terms with it's like it was always a chore something i felt that i have to do <laughs> it's like i had to exercise otherwise i would be you know ill and letting my family down let my kids down and then i'd be this and i'd be that like it was just guilt ridden guilt isn't enough of a motivator mm. what i want to and add on to that though is resistance training is different from like traditional exercise most people when they think of exercise they think of cardio running walking doing this that and the other fine yeah um and i've sort of covered that in that you can kind of do cardio without going to a gym you can just walk around the house or be on your feet more that's literally just it um standing desk i may cover in a second <laughs> uh resistance training however oh, i'm intrigued by that i got a standing desk uh, resistance training however is, is different there's a different purpose to resistance training which is strength and you can't get strength by just walking around doing stuff uh, mm. you, as as we get older our muscles atrophy because we don't use them as much and our body like decreases and in, in its ability to maintain muscle when we're not using it so strength training is a way to maintain the strength that you may think you have um, and most people will recognize as you get older you suddenly think oh i used to be able to do that when i was younger that's because you used to train it <laughs> you used to whatever it was like lift stuff more or move around the house more or you used to play games in the playground at school or whatever um and that strength because you're not using it you lose it and resistance training is a way to either maintain strength or gain strength depending on if you need it or not um but if you do need to suddenly move boxes around but you don't move boxes on a regular basis that strength isn't going to be there uh, and as you get older it's going to decrease quicker and faster so resistance training gives you the ability to do the things that you might not do on a regular basis but still do them like hoovering if you don't hoover every day pushing a hoover backwards and forwards takes a lot of strength <laughs> might not think it but as you get older it gets hard to push a hoover around mm. and it's those it's those sort of things that resistance training help with so i, I don't know if you want to add something in there or if you want me to talk about standing desks Go standing desk. I'm really intrigued by your... I mean, I have a standing desk. I use a standing desk. I 
partly used it for I know I'm sedentary and sit down way too much. But one, I've got a very good chair. I went and spent a ton of money on a good chair. I am very fortunate to be able to do so on purpose because I knew I was going to be sat in it a lot. But I also bought a standing desk to give me the ability because when I stand up, I can process things better. It's easier. But there was also like a, well, if I stand up more, it's healthier. I have a feeling that's about to be absolutely destroyed and I cannot wait. I'm so intrigued to understand this more. Go for it. So when when most people think of standing desks, they think about posture, right? That, that, that's, that's, that's the typical approach people take. Oh, yeah, standing desk is better for your posture. Um, no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, there, 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 is, there is a different posture that you are in. But Stuart McGill, who has done lots of research on spinal health, basically suggests that, well, suggests and has proven that standing up by itself is just a different way of being in a stable position. Like the best way to keep your spine healthy and your posture healthy is to move, like to be in different positions. The biggest issue about sitting down all day is your spine is in the same position, not moving, not requiring any stability in any moving action. It's just, hey, spine sit in this position done the leaning over thing can also happen when you're standing up <laughs> um it's it's not a oh you stand up and you don't lean over no because if the screen is in front of you, you can still lean over and you still have that hunch uh, and so it comes down to the position of where your keyboard is where your mouse is and what you're actually doing with your back so standing up itself doesn't solve any problems it may help you work in a different way like you say like you, you think more when you stand up or you can move around or maybe you're, you're more energetic because you can move your hands. And we know that moving your hands and gestures help with your ability to process and help cognitive function. Um, the Extended Mind is a great book on that. Uh, so standing up is useful for cognition and thinking for some people, um, more beneficial for other people. And have you just written down that book as a note? <laughs> 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 the extended mind um i think uh, andy clark was the academic that wrote it or maybe that was paul i can't remember which book was which um but yeah and and they they, they spoke about how gestures help your cognitive thinking and standing up can help that but if you have a chair that allows you to use all your hands then maybe the benefit isn't there so when it comes to healthy does it help your spine being in a different position yes so if you go from standing to sitting to standing to sitting that can be useful. Or if you're standing and you're walking around and moving around, as in walking away from the desk and back to the desk, it's useful. Can you do that with a chair? Yeah, because <laughs> you're moving away from the desk. So a standing desk itself doesn't help posture. Um, can it then help with burning calories or ex energy expenditure, etc.? Well, like I said earlier, BMR, basal, met basal metabolic rate, like if you stand there and don't move, you're just standing no. still. <laughs> If you're sitting down, fidgeting about, you're burning more. Um, but yeah. It's, yeah. it's also why, like, so underneath my feet, because I, one thing I noticed when I first started standing up and I did a little bit of, like, just light research, blog posts mainly, um, not proper research. Um, <laughs> uh, not academic you, you put, research. You put that academic. caveat in there now. <laughs> oh, I do. I do, because it's, it, it's important context. Um yeah. But a lot of the research said that you shouldn't be keeping still when you're standing and often you you are standing on a very hard floor. Something that I learned when I did do some form of, I can't remember what it was, some form of training I did at one point um, just because I was intrigued to try it. I was going through a hyperfixation, so I did it, um, was how hard the floor in my studio is and it bloody hurt. <laughs> so I on purposely had bought um, a wobble board. Like I bought my one from Fully and they have like a, a a wobble board where you just stand on and you just swing from side to side, which supposedly is better for you because you're moving your ankles. It also means you're moving too. So because a lot of pressure on the feet or something. That's what I read. Whether that is true or not is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are there are elements of truth in there. You've got to think like when when you stand up your entire body is now going through your feet. Like we yeah. all know that if you stand up all day or you walk around all day, you go shopping for like three hours because someone can't decide what they want. You, you know, your feet hurt because you've been standing up yeah. all day. Uh, and, and it's the same principle. If you stand up in front of your desk for eight hours in a day, your feet are going to kill because your body, however much you weigh is going through your feet all day. And if you don't move, which 
you probably end up stepping around and moving around because you'd, you'd be achy. Um, if you don't move, you're going to hurt because <laughs> our, our bodies weren't designed to stand in the same position for eight hours. If, if it was, we probably wouldn't have legs. <laughs> yeah. So I'm intrigued. I have a question for you. What... If you just want to stay at the health you're at, not necessarily want to get maybe a little bit healthier, but just sustain and have a sustainable, healthy life, what would you do? What would you suggest as a general thing? <laughs> I know. Gen pop. <laughs> gen pop. Gen, gen pop. Gen Because obviously population. what's normally being said is, oh, eat really healthy, you know, go exercise at the gym 30 minutes a day, etc., etc. blah, blah, blah. What would you, like, if you just want to sustain and you're coming at it from a very different perspective of, like, just keeping going and you have little time? I mean, the, the traditional guidelines are for s significant differences in health studies, essentially. Um, so the, the moving around, what was it, like three three sections of like 30 minutes a day of medium intensity exercise whatever that means um that sort of stuff all, all those guidelines are useful they're certainly if if you can do them do them if you can't it's not the end of the world uh <laughs> because when you when you think about daily moving if you're picking so for example some people pick their kids up from school right and they walk and stand in the playground <clears throat> When you're when you're walking like to the school from the school if you walk to and from and don't drive uh, like that walking right there could be your 20 minute walk a day uh, and you standing in the playground if you just like fiddle around like instead of standing completely still when you're talking to other parents you can just move around in your feet there you go you're up you're up and you're on your and you're on your feet um <clears throat> So those those sort of like guidelines don't take into account all the other things you do throughout the day. If you sit on your bottom all day, then standing up and walking around in your office when thinking or reading or or drinking or just a break, that that's fine. Like that could be your 20 minutes instead of like instead of sitting on your computer playing a game for a five minute break, 10 minute break, however long it is, just stand up and walk around your office. Like for me. I do my vlog and I, I talk to my camera, but you could talk to your phone or an audio recording or whatever. I, I walk around doing that. So that's a 10 minute walk right there. Yes, I'm walking backwards and forwards and I probably look silly, but hey, I'm walking around. Um, then when it comes to the resistance training element, I would say it's not as important for people that aren't going to be doing anything heavy, but the older you get, the more important it's going to be uh, because we, we atrophy does that mean you need to go to the gym and do all these different movements and this that and the other no if if you did it would be better but you don't need to you could quite simply just use different body weight movements to do most um of the things so your your traditional squat hip hinge like deadlift uh, and then the overhead press or the vertical presses the all the stuff with your arms just pick up something that's heavy just pick up a box, <laughs> pick up a chair a couple of times, move the table. Like the, you, you've got loads of stuff in the house that's heavy. So if you move the table backwards and forwards, that's a pull. That's a horizontal pull. Um, if, like that, and then if you're pushing the table, there's your bench press. Yes, it's different angles, blah, blah, blah. But there's very similar muscles. If you're picking up a chair, like if you could sit on the floor, pick up the chair and just move it above your head a few times, there's your overhead press. Like, use the stuff that's in your house. Um, you don't have to go to a gym because I know some people also struggle going to the gym because of all the intimidation that's in there. Like you see some massive guy like moving loads and loads of weight. You don't really want to be sat next to him. Like, the gym that I go to when I can with my eye uh, is a powerlifting gym. And there are people in there lifting 200, 250, sometimes 300 deadlifts. And I'm standing there like, yeah, I can only do 70 because of my eye pressure. Uh, so there i got one one guy next to me doing 250 next guy next to me doing 290 i'm sat in the middle doing 70 for those of you that don't quite understand the differences i have like two 25 kilo plates with a couple of plates on they've got like five plates each side <laughs> plus more like yeah, often <laughs> there's, there's a massive difference so you can, and you it, can and just it, imagine and it bar also bar. feeds into the to the media around how bad and broken you are because the industry is huge this isn't a conspiracy theory this is marketing it's mm -hmm. like you've got to be made to feel like there's something wrong with you um and that's what they do because if you're broken then uh, you have a solution then you are fixed that's what most business people are taught to do poke at pain points and 
make people feel like they need something. Yeah, and the direction I want to go now is the difference in mental health. Now, mental health is obviously a big topic, um, and psychologists and therapists have stigma around them. And I listen to a lot of psychology podcasts and their conversations because psychology has almost everything to do with learning. Cognitive psychology, which is actually one of the first books I'm going to be reading, like since uh, year four, so when I was like 10. <laughs> I've actually bought the book, so I'm actually going to read the book. Um, yeah, I know, scary stuff. It's like a thousand pages long as well. Uh, <clears throat> Hang on. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I just hold the phone. Hold the episode there. Thank you very much. You're reading a book. I will be. Yeah, I haven't got the book yet. Because I can't get access to it. Are you okay? It. Are you okay? Yes, yeah, so I just can't get access to it. So Yeah, no, no. <laughs> it's like I, I, I have access to it on my PC. Um but it's through my sister's uni account and it's a PDF file that's protected by DVM. So I can't highlight or do anything with it. It's just, Hey, you can read it. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy the book. I know it's annoying. Um, but yeah, so, and, and mental health, going back to that psychology, <laughs> um, there's, there's this precedent over psychologists as, Oh, you need to be broken. So we're going to fix you. And my, my mental approach to this is when you go to a physio you're not necessarily broken you just have an injury like you've you've strained this or you've sprained that i'm going to get some get some rehab and solve the injury and i would see a lot of mental health issues as injuries because some things like anxiety or stresses could be things that you experience over a week or two weeks because of the environment or the event that's happened and for me i see that as a mental injury rather than a mental illness or something i need fixing it's just something that's happened i see, I see you're aggressively nodding yeah i'm my current counselor therapist whatever um as she said a really i liked what she said it was sometimes when you need help it's not necessarily because you need to fix something it's like a mental mot you know it's like just a checkup it's like how are you feeling shit okay cool let's explore that and then you just by exploring that there's a lot of help that it can provide a lot of relief and release and often the mental as I saw a post the other day, I think it was actually Rebecca who shared it, around sometimes, like, there's a lot of thing around self-care and it's got to look sexy and attractive and pretty and all this crap. I think this is more, unfortunately, um, for those who identify as female, and that is what they have to face more than us, I think, mm. um, in general. And it's like the self-care makes, you, you know, putting on makeup makes yourself look pretty and run a bath. No, sometimes it's sitting in a really dirty room eating some beans because you just can't deal with it today and i think that's like really that's real self-care and it's not always a big thing and it's not always you know i think bouncing off of your point on the mental health thing of like fixing what is broken it's like accepting where you are and coming to terms with that and then moving from that it's not woe is me i have this nothing everything is bad it's going yeah this is something i genuinely struggle with and it's not something that i can just fix by flicking a switch it's not me trying to get over it or it's not something to get over it's something to accept i've had anxiety all of my life i have a low level anxiety never ending always going every single second of every single day and the only way I was able to overcome it was just go, okay, I'm anxious. That's it. It was just the case of going, okay, I am anxious right now and accepting that right now I cannot do the thing that I would like to do. And I'm going to upset people and tough. This is what I actually need for my mental health, even though it's hard. And it's about coming to terms with that and, and understanding that. I think that's really important yeah i think so when it comes to like the physical health and the mental health when when you think about physical health a lot of people know in their head uh oh yeah i need to go i need to go to the physio or i need to go to the gym or i need to move around and do this that um and 
when you're moving around your body, you're getting feedback in your body going a little bit sciencey here, but every movement you do, every sense you have, every feeling of something goes to your brain and your brain can interpret that. Whether that interpretation is correct or not, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but, but you get information into your head. When you're thinking about stuff, you don't always get the information into your head as a separate like awareness cue or interoceptive cue because you're thinking about it. So you must know what it is. N not necessarily because self-awareness as we know from psychology is different to thinking about something because we can all think something and not really be aware of what we're thinking or the consequences of those actions or anything like that so the, the feedback we get for mentally uh the, the actions we take is different and a lot of people don't train that because we're, we're not taught to train that where... yeah and I, I've I think I've blown so many when I've done workshops that talk about I, I, I use the Gestalt cycle of experience because I feel it's such a it's a really easy way of getting started with it of just understanding what a Gestalt cycle is and going around and how we are using our awareness and uh, a podcast I just released this week. Oh, sorry. No, last week at the time of this episode going out actually goes through the whole cycle of experience and talks about it and the brain ways that people have of like oh yeah no that makes perfect sense and it matches like Kolb's learning cycle it you know the practice triangle oh practice oh look at that um you know um and it matches all of those things and they all come together of, of like what are you going to do doing what you're going to do reflecting on what you're going to do and it's just that repeated process simplified to a gross understatement there are multiple sections in that uh watch my podcast to hear that because i could talk for hours about this um and like the awareness cycle often people when i speak to people they miss the beginning bit of like just that sensation or like the actual beginning like huh that's the thing i'm feeling or it's before the huh that's the thing i'm feeling and often we miss that and we either don't plan we don't take action or we don't reflect and it's just fascinating how our minds work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And the wh where I would take this, because we've sort of done the physical health, we've done the mental health, yeah. um, is like like you say, moving on to practice, is moving on to the habits that can actually help those things. Like with physical health, just building up habits. So instead of sitting on your computer all day, uh, just getting up and moving around or becoming a fidget bum <laughs> like it, it can help not not everyone obviously can do that but just finding things that you do throughout your day and it or maybe just recognizing things that you're already doing because there are lots of things then, that we yeah. do that are physical already yeah absolutely just recognizing what you already do often there is a i think i made a post about this uh regarding learning something and how notion has a massive learning curve yet we don't start at the beginning of the curve, we start in the middle, because there are already things that we do, but we just think we have to start all over again. I think a lot of the, and in the past, it's like, oh, I've got to create a new routine to be more healthy. I've got to start something new. I've got to start something new. Whereas if you stack on top of something you already do, it it, it becomes easier. It, it, it is easier for you to latch onto and just catch onto because it's, yeah, isn't yeah. That habit? That's habit stacking. It's called, isn't it? Oh, there's so many terms you could dump in there. My my thinking or approach around it would be that we all we all live, we all have experiences, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so we really? all have, yeah. So we all have prior knowledge, and no one is starting from nothing. We always have information, whether that's misinformation, misconceptions, uh, or perfect truths and facts and justified reasons, like we all have prior knowledge so we're never starting from zero uh, and i there's loads of research and studies obviously showing this but one of the one of the papers that's in the mos uh, talks about misconceptions and how our preconceptions so what we think we know will shape the actions that we do in lessons and school and learning and stuff but it's also the same in habits in life what we think we know about something will educate our habits and unless you challenge or at least become aware of those habits, those preconceptions, you're not going to do anything different. And starting something new, you're trying to forget the things you already know, but you can't do that. Uh, so you're using the biases you already have from your prior knowledge when starting something new, which normally makes it harder because you're 
trying something new that conflicts with prior knowledge, but you haven't acknowledged you have the prior knowledge to start with. And you're like, well, I don't know where to start now. Yeah. And that's where the overwhelm comes of like, I don't know what to do. You're like, what exercises should I do? Tell me what to do. Tell me this. Tell me that. Tell me this. Tell me that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And those habits that we build obviously become a practice. Uh, <laughs> like the, the, the practice Segway! that we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah yeah i was, I was gonna say that <laughs> the i i had something in my head and i was like i need to respond to what he said i it responded now what am i what am i thinking um the 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 term practice obviously we're going to get into it in a second uh, but practice and habits are very very like synonymous you can't really have a habit without practice um which yeah i know which obviously we're going to get into a second but with, with, with the habit you can't do it without some sort of continued practice um so yeah we're let, let's go and let's go into the words um i haven't even got it open on my screen so john do you want to go first <laughs> shit so i'm probably going to come from practice from a more musical standpoint because that's what i did so from <laughs> a learning education standpoint learning how to play the guitar learning how to play the piano like i think that's right that's the context skill acquisition yes that fancy pants word well done. words there's two <laughs> yeah well <laughs> shush yeah so the first one is actually completely the opposite of that it's active experimentation i think we're always practicing things we're always figuring stuff out. Yeah, I went exactly the wrong way that I was literally contradicting myself. But, you know, it's fine. Um, life is a paradox. It's active experimentation. The art of practicing is to actively experiment in your life. It's to actively try things over and over again to develop skills that you can then use in your real life. I don't disagree, but I don't agree either. <laughs> Yay! Um, so when, when you say active experimentation, I wouldn't say that is practice because when you're actively experimenting, you could be actively experimenting in literally anything, anytime, anywhere. Uh, so I think there needs to be some, uh, some consistency in the actions that you take with a varying degree. Yeah, I, th I, I, I agree. And actually, that's one of my later points. I agree okay. with that. So it's interesting that I put active experimentation. I think perhaps when I went, what is a, I think that point was what is, what is a practice I have, which is active experimentation. That's perhaps where my brain went straight away. So that might okay. be where my brain went. Because I actually went on and said the other thing. So your first point, go. Yeah. Um, application of an idea. Ooh. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Application of an idea because a lot of us, the, the my my thinking around that point was a lot of us think of theory. We think of lots of stuff. We think mm. we know what we're going to do, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But practice is the application, the actual doing of the thing. Whether that is a physical doing of the thing or a thinking doing of the thing, uh <laughs> it's it's applying whatever your your, your plan is your theory is uh, in some sort of practice so applying theory to practice uh, and that could be done and obviously in lots of different ways which goes on to a couple of the other points i've got but it's actually doing something rather than just thinking about something yes thinking could be a practice but rather than thinking about doing something it's actually doing the thing hopefully that makes sense i i realize i said thing lots <laughs> So it's a technical term that thing yeah thing you know the thing that you think the thing that things that thing yes mm -hmm. exactly thingy thing yeah i actually have a similar kind of overall thought apart from that first one um was like it's repeating a practical application to help develop flow and aid creativity it is not in itself a creative thing practice is not inherently creative you can make it creative but and remember context musician etc like when i practice i'm not trying to create music i am practicing and developing a skill 
I am focused. It is focused to one intention of developing my practice. I cannot wait for this. I'm really intrigued. Mm. <laughs> I mm. agree, but I don't agree. <laughs> hmm. We could get very philosophical here. Um, oh, let's go philosophical. Come I'm, on, I'm going to try and avoid it as, as much as possible. Right. Come on. No, um, no, no, no. Don't do that. Come on. Come on. But, okay. So you, you said creative and i don't want to get onto the word creative because that's obviously another word that we could even talk about um so i'm going to try and avoid creative because i think there's different ways of being creative in different contexts and what creativity looks like is going to change on context so i don't think practice can be creative or not creative because i think it's context dependent um now my that's why I did add the context of yeah. in music, it's not creative. It is like you're playing a no effective practice in music is taking two bars, repeating it, adding in desirable diff difficulty um, to practice the skill. Um, <laughs> I, I can't wait. Yeah, I, I disagree. That is a type of practice. Uh, and it's kind of one of my points later on. I would say that is a type of practice, but I think practice can be creative uh, because of the different approach you can take. Now, I want to try and avoid overcomplicating this, but, <laughs> skill, but skill acquisition, there are essentially two philosophical approaches to skill acquisition. One, information processing, i.e. Uh, I get information, it goes to my head, I make a decision about what I'm going to do, and then I do the thing. And then ecological dynamics, which, again, essentially, you get information from the environment and you make a decision around what you're going to do with that thing. Now, information processing, typically, uh, depending on the approach of the theory and all the other context you add to it, there is a right way to do the thing. There is a, I'm going to push for in your music example, I'm going to push these keys in this order, and this is how this thing works. Yeah. So no. If if you're playing if you're playing a tune, because what you were just saying is you you're going to practice this thing. Uh, but how are keys? There is there is a lot more nuance to that. That obviously, as not a musician, you're missing. I think so there are multiple ways to play a, a key on a piano or a, a, a note on a guitar and that is the skill it is like very so I'm gonna go just I'm just gonna break play... it all the way down if you want to play a c key mm -hmm. how do you push the key well that would be dependent on the context because tonality like the more you push it the less yeah, you push because it. the harder you, the, the softness the the how hard i push it how how long I sustain the note, that is what you develop through practice. I agree. Um, and I like the way that you're going as well. So information processing suggests that there is one way to do the thing, i.e. there is a certain there's a certain amount of pressure that you push the key for that song. Yes. Right? And that's that's how you do the thing. That's information processing. <laughs> Ecological dynamics suggests that as the environment changes, i.e. in your music example, as the song changes or your interpretation of the song changes, you are going to change your action, right? In which case the environment shapes the practice, which means practice isn't doing the same thing over and over and over again because you're responding to the environment rather than the expected answer that you think you have. I agree, but also don't agree. Okay. To develop, and I'm I'm gonna stick with music because it's the best mm -hmm. example I've got. Like, for you to be able to perform that, you have to know exactly the depth you push down on your fingers on a key where, or or a fret on guitar. You have to know the the muscle memory needs to be developed to know where that is. And what the aim is of practice in music is to get to a point where it's all very much muscle memory and then you can take the concepts and use them anywhere, but you have to practice them and you have to find the individual, like, I think talking about the environment, I suppose you have, you choose the environment and it's like, um, a more, 
not sterile. That's not the word I'm looking for. It 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 is a more um. a controlled environment not just letting the environment affect it it is a controlled environment that you choose the dynamics of that you choose the what the variables are what you are practicing like okay so i want to play a c note well there are like i don't know a hundred different ways of playing a c note way more than that <laughs> yeah there's probably i just said a hundred because it was a round number it was nice um yeah so when when i say environment i'm bringing in obviously this is me understanding ecological dynamics i'm bringing in all the other constraints so that could be where your hand is before where your hand yes. is needs to go after the pressure it was before the pressure after the key that you're hitting where your other hand is where your feet are where your body is and then everything else going on in your head about the decisions you're going to make moving forwards because if you do hit the key slightly later slightly earlier that is a different dynamic an environmental dynamic that changes how you're going to perform the action whereas information processing says you push the key like this practice is a control is controlling the dynamic that's part mm -hmm. of it is where you're controlling the dynamics that you're working with so it's focused like one of my notes is focused and skill based and less creative yes you can incorporate creativity in there and that is something you can do but primarily the idea behind a practice music focus this is the context i'm working from and the only context i'm working from right now um is you have to have that you have to develop the skill of being able to move from different fingers and have a very like just moving from you know one fret to another varies like you were saying depending on the environment you have to be able to really see that like deliberate practice you you know that very yeah. much yeah it's so it's, of... it's very much deliberate practice and i think you're very right that it is different if you're just practicing creativity, you can practice creativity, but that is a form of, a, it is focused. You're focusing on creativity. You're focusing on bringing in multiple um, environmental effects at once. So deliberate practice is kind of like a, a point that I raised a little bit later on. Um, but deliberate practice is normally breaking a skill, breaking a whole skill down into something else so playing a song you would play all of these different notes and these different notes are different skills and maybe you want to deliberately practice how to play that note or that fret whatever um and deliberate practice is certainly useful certainly not disputing that <laughs> um but when you break a skill down it doesn't necessarily mean you can then suddenly insert that skill into song information processing would suggest that once you've learned the, the broken down skill, that's the right way to do it. You just insert it into this larger skill, which in your case would be a song and it works. And from the sounds of it, you don't agree. No. That's ecological dynamics. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mm. See, the problem with that is there are multiple layers. It depends on how deep you go. Because when it comes to practicing going from one note to another, so often what I have done, what I've taught, what I've learned um, is obviously, here we go, employing desirable difficulty where you make things slightly harder to make it easier, et cetera, et cetera. And so you practice it from a harder perspective to make it flow easier. And the things you learn just from by focusing down on one thing, this very much is more a hands-on approach that I'm talking about. This isn't the thinking approach that I think we normally talk about on here. This is a very like physical thing because playing a, an instrument, a guitar is very physical. So it, I think practice is different based on whether you're thinking, whether it's a thinking practice or doing practice. You you went in like four different directions. Yeah, I did. <laughs> um, so the squirrel, when... squirrel, 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 squirrel. Yeah. So I I would say what what you you introduced task difficulty and again ecological dynamics suggests task difficult task task difficulty. There we go. Easy for me to well, say. Um, <laughs> it's changed through constraints and affordances. So if you've made something harder or easier through the environment, which again 
what that's doing is it's impacting the type of practice. So the purpose of the practice is to expose the person to something that may be harder to help them learn something else, um, which suggests that there isn't a right way to do the thing or a wrong way to do the thing. There are just different ways you can do the thing. Uh, again, information processing, ecological dynamics. So the focus of the training, um, maybe increasing the task difficulty because of constraints, mm. um, helps you learn the different ways to get to the the points the keys the whatever um in the in the thing so i think practice um as a as an overall term is the application of doing the thing with a in my opinion purpose on evolving a skill as a whole rather than disparate uh, discrete individual things that may not necessarily yeah. transfer over but again like this is a philosophical discussion between information processing and ecological dynamics. And trust me, the arguments go like extremely in depth, um, but I, I try to be as shallow as possible. I think it's kind of both. I think it's a You, you can't be both. You, it's, it's, it's fundamentally impossible to be both <laughs> because Why? of the assumptions that are made. Oh, no. We, 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 mm. Yeah. Um, but again, this, this is going to be an extremely complex conversation if we move into the assumptions made. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. I think it'll be like a three hour episode if we start going yeah. in there. Well, yeah, because there's going to be, there's, there would have to be like theoretical basis explained, then foundations of like research explained, then different types of practice explained. Bye, and, audience. See you later. networks. And yeah, and then you'd have to like bring it all the way back. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just, you, you, some people try and combine them together, but you can't. So I will try and explain this as simply as possible. Information processing information goes into head you make decision you make action ecological dynamics within reason information make action in information in ecological dynamics you don't go in and you process you think about and you consider and do this that the other and then you make the action it's just these are the constraints that have been given to me i'm going to do this thing um yes there's loads of nuance in that information processing if you're saying you can do both uh, the reason it's impossible is you can't get information, put it in your head, and then decide I'm not going to make a decision on this because you've already made the decision to think about it. Does that make sense? Mm. So you can't decide not to make a decision you've already made. It's just fundamentally impossible, <laughs> um, which is where things shift and change. And obviously prior knowledge is important in both, but prior knowledge in economical dynamics helps form the action you make without making a decision you don't actively go i'm going to think about what i did before and then make the the, the action you just you do it it's kind of more instinctive it's not not technically correct but um well i think about what i'm going to do before i do it and then decide whether i'm going to do it or not and then i try to process what i've just done and so i do that's that's decision making rather than practice <laughs> using constraints and affordances mm. And again, let's leave that there we, before we, we, we die. We, we, yeah, again, we, we would go, go way too deep into that. Let's just let's just uh, stop. For, for anyone interested, uh, Perception Action Podcast from Rod, Rob Gray is probably a good good place to to dive into because he speaks about ecological uh, ecological and information processing uh, a little bit. So I, I feel like John is going to have a have a little lesson to that. Um, yeah. So my my second point because um, I didn't actually go to my second point, is motivated by internal drives. And the reason I've said this is it's not the same as studying because studying and practice can result in the same thing, can both result in learning. But I don't think people want to study a lot of the time, whereas people more, more are more often wanting to do practice. That's the way I see it anyway. Um, but I realize that that's very subjective. <laughs> he's he's thinking i am genuinely that that's hmm it's, it's very subjective because obviously motivation is subjective but when i think of practice i think i of don't something... disagree hmm. i think that's that's literally my only response is i don't disagree <laughs> <laughs> great uh because yeah, my, yeah my, my, I, my i don't have that... much more with it 
Yeah, my thinking is that studying is driven more typically by cultural expectations or external drives. Like I want to get this certificate. I want to get a good mark on the test or I want to look good in front of these people. I need to study for this. Whereas I see practice as more of a, I want to get mastery orientation. I want to improve. I want to get better at this thing. So I should probably practice. Um, that, that's, that's how I see it. But again, that's kind of subjective. Mm -hmm. But they can both result in learning. So, yeah, self determination theory. <laughs> I don't. I don't have any points to that. I mean, I don't actually have any more points. I pretty much went deep into my points completely. Nice, nice. Yeah, my my third point is kind of like types of practice. So, I tried to break it down into four, but it's not really. Um, I got <laughs> blocked. Yeah, I've got blocked practice, spaced practice, interleaved practice, and then repeated practice, like repetition. Oh, interleaved practice is so much fun. <laughs> and um, sucks at the same time. Yeah, I, I, and I, I was thinking about something related actually yesterday. Um, in the spaced repetition is this thing that people talk about when learning. Um, and it's sometimes for whatever reason it's portrayed as a thing that's new it's this new study technique and i'm sitting here like no we do it when we're younger like if we mess up we do it again if we mess up we do it again until we get like frustrated that we've messed it up so many times and we stop doing it that that is space repetition <laughs> that is you doing something you're getting it wrong or you're not doing it the way you want to do it and then do it again it's not new it's part of natural learning um and I think that's I think I think that actually brings up a good point of like so much of what is being seen as new isn't. I could rant it's about like, that for an hour. It's like the concepts that I am introducing is like, oh, you know, the you know, Gestalt cycle of experience. That is a thing. It just is. That's how we do things. And yet we don't realize we don't have the awareness of our own awareness because we use the word awareness and don't actually freaking use it. We're not aware of our awareness. Yeah. Awesome. And it's fascinating how much we don't understand our own mind and or even like don't understand how it works. I was going to say understand. I think like obviously research into understanding of what the word actually means is I, I try to be more precise with my words now rather than saying understand because understand is quite broad because you can have shallow right. and deep understanding and then depending on how you use the term so i would probably say that we we understand what awareness is but our depth of understanding and the connections of concepts that we can make with it are limited because it's not taught what you said <laughs> uh yeah so going back to the, the block space interleaved repetition etc i think they are all parts like parts of practice like if if you don't do something a second time you haven't practiced it <laughs> that's the way i see it you've just experienced it experiencing something and practicing something are different things how you choose to do that practice i.e blocked spaced interleaved repetition without repetition repetition with repetition repetition with dynamics repetition with ecology whatever that's the problem. <laughs> Don't go there again. Just leave it alone now. Put it what in the I? box. It's, leave yeah. it for later. <laughs> I'm thinking of a volleyball study that I've included in the Mo's, and I was like, oh, yeah, I could. No, let's not talk about that. Um, <laughs> uh, for those interested in reading my research in the Mo's, yeah, like link on link on the website uh, but yeah so practice is essentially doing something more than once. It's experiencing something more than once. That's how I, I see practice. All right. Um, John's John's. Just, yep. Next point. I, I kind of, so I put deliberate practice in brackets um, and then said training versus fun. Right. So, so there are, again, lots of different directions I could take. And there are lots of, and this is what irritates me about the word like practice and learning is in sports coaching, this, this research is all over the place. And there's so much of it and none of it's spoken about on YouTube or just anywhere on blogs. It's so annoying because all the sports coaches obviously don't go on YouTube. <laughs> um, they're, they're, they're busy coaching kids. Um, so training versus fun also relates to early specialization versus multi multi-sport training when you're younger which can relate to ltad long-term athlete development and essentially when you're when you're training you're doing deliberate practice you're doing something with a focus um that that's practice 
but when you're having fun and you're playing you're also practicing because you're repeating skills that you have either learned or haven't quite learned yet so it's still practice like when when you're playing i'm going to use sports as an example when you're playing football on the playground you're still practicing things you're training uh in your club or whatever you're still practicing it it's just not with a goal a deliberate target a purpose you're just learning the skill you're practicing the skill in a much less constrained environment do you disagree mm, i do not not agree <laughs> It's again, it ah, it, I think we have to be mm. because going on our going on my previous point, practice is repetition of, of an experience. Whether there is a goal target thing on it or not, you're still doing repetition. Now, the benefit, like the efficiency of that practice will obviously be impacted, and the efficiency of practice goes into a whole other conversation, but I still think it's practice. I think it, I think the word that I'm catching on is the implementation of practice. It's actually using what you practice. It's implementing what you've trained yourself to do in an active scenario. But even that, I don't like. It's not quite right. But I think. Do, do a, a you question get for you I'm in music, then. A question mm -hmm. for you in music, then. When you know a song and you play mm -hmm. a song but you, you know the song, you've played it, and then you play a song, but you play it slightly differently to a different audience or a different tempo. Is that practice? So you know how to play a song, you know it in and out, and then you decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to play it in front of my family um, for Christmas or whatever, and then someone joins in, or maybe you slow it down for something, or maybe you go to a different beat because of someone's dancing or whatever. Is that practice? Yes and no. <laughs> so I think the problem with that word, or the word in general, unlike a lot of the other words we've done, is the you, you just genuinely don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I genuinely don't know. Is it actually practice? Does my prior knowledge believe it's practice? No. But can I see how it could be practice? I guess. I view it as practicing a performance. Practicing performing, not practicing the other skills. Then again, I am practicing putting together multiple skills at what? There is so many layers of depth to it that makes it far less easy to go. Yes, I agree. No, I don't agree. I do agree, but I don't agree. I, I think it's both. Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously skill acquisition is something I've explored for the last five years. So I've gone to depth in all of those points. <laughs> so, um, so you're yeah. cheating, basically. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's just using prior knowledge. You have prior knowledge yeah, yeah. too. <laughs> um, application of an idea. I'm going to go back to my first point. Application of an idea. I, I would say that practicing something is like I say, an application of an idea, which could be repeated something over time, which again, to me, if you're like, take it, take football, for example, like playing, playing a game on a Sunday or Saturday, or whenever you play the football game, I would say play like the match is still practice for the skills you're learning and training. Mm -hmm. That That's how I see it. Um, but yeah. And then my last point, so I'll, I'll leave John to ponder that for a bit, <laughs> uh, is towards an answer or set of answers. Now, I've put that in there, partly related to, yeah, partly related to what I was saying earlier about having like deliberate practice, having a goal, there may be an answer. There, there may be, this is how I do this thing. And I say set of answers because right, we're not going to go there again, but ecological dynamics, there could be a set of answers. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, as to as to how to get, yeah, as to as to the different results you could get from practice because practicing something like what we're doing now, I would say like this isn't necessarily deliberate practice of any sort, but we're still practicing our ideas and our way of thinking around 
what practice is. Um, and if we do this again, I would say it's it's furthering the conversation, like deepening our understanding of something. Um, mm. But there, there is no one answer, as we've obviously ex extensively explored. Uh, I would say there's more than one answer, but I would still say this is practice. So I would say, like applying in action an idea, because the idea is practice. We are applying that idea in this conversation. And I would say this conversation is our practice in trying to learn how we can explain what practice is or how we can apply practice in another setting. That is extremely philosophical. So I'm going to let you talk for a bit. Cheers. Thanks for that to unpack that. You're just like, here's the philosoph philosophical debate. Discuss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I. Words. <laughs> yes. I'm just going to say yes, because I don't really have. I'm still processing the ideas that we're talking about. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. So I don't think I load. have a. Yeah. So I think my cognitive load has just reached the point of like. Fuck. Yeah, like that. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Pretty much. Like the... my... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like this this is one of those this is one of those times where um I, I like to give an example in cognitive load theory for those that are unfamiliar uh, essentially you have a bandwidth and i like in, in my head i have concept a is like four point like you've got bandwidth of 10 concept a is four points concept b is four points processing those concepts maybe two points now you have a bandwidth of 10 someone adds something in or you're either throwing something out or you or you're not bringing that new thing in uh, and sometimes concept A maybe one, concept B maybe two, but combining them together maybe eight. So you're like, yeah. what? Uh, and I feel like like that sort of example. Obviously, there's more than three things in our brain. There's far more um, working memory capacity and blah 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 schema, etc. Yeah. If you want to know about con uh, cognitive load theory, I think I've got a blog article going up at some point soon. Actually, no, it's just the paper. It's a review of the paper, the 2011 Sweller paper. Um, but yeah, so that, that's Ooh. that's how that's how I kind of see like your head at the moment. You're like, yeah, yeah, my, my brain, my brain be big. <laughs> yeah. Big brain. Me, me, big brain and, and broken brain. <laughs> but yeah, I this is such a fascinating conversation and there's also we haven't even touched on the emotional aspects of practice because there's a lot of pressure you want to in... go there no i don't think i do i think i'm too i don't think i don't think i have the cognitive load to do that just like the the just i'm gonna stop oh yeah, go for it i just i just won't say anything no that's pointless <laughs> Okay, I, I, I would just add, I'll, I'll add a couple of things then when it like with with emotion and psychology. Um, every every perception that we create through an action in practice uh, is going to elicit a different response depending on your prior experience. So your your brain may think, oh, yeah, this is good. Or, oh, wait, no, this is not good. Or this is bad. Or the emotions, social pressures and expectations, self-fulfilling prophecy, the expectations from others or yourself. Um, all impacting how you perceive the practice to have gone you may think the practice is really good or you may think it's really bad but someone else's expectations may improve that or decrease that and all of those social agents um impact motivation and learning <laughs> in practice okay my brain caught up i yawned and processed there we go better now what <laughs> practice threw it all out. isn't <laughs> practice is not perfection it is not the art of perfecting something it is never oh question for you okay right you know that you know you know the saying right mm. practice makes perfect i'm gonna thump you thank you Th i yeah. hate it i, I hate cannot that. stand I it i can't i can't i can't cope i cannot cope i cannot cope so just as a, like a, an aside, maybe to help with the connection, information processing, that statement is, is sound. Information processing, practice makes perfect, yes. Ecological dynamics, no. <laughs> I think one, one phrase I heard was practice makes permanence. I've heard so many different variations. Like that one is, is better, but still shit. I was going to say, yeah, it's better than perfect, but it's still awful. <laughs> I, every time I hear someone says practice makes perfect, it's like, no, no, it doesn't. 
get that out of your like i have gone on you just want to slap it, him in the face like no yeah it, it literally <laughs> is every time i see someone practice makes perfect no it fucking doesn't stop saying that you are completely dismissing years of psychology research that actually tell you no anyway i mean a, a perfect a perfect example oh, would God. be <laughs> A, a good example would be if you do something that's wrong or bad or ill-practiced or ill-advised or maybe based off of misconception, you may be you may be thinking you're doing the perfect thing, but you're you were biased to start with or you didn't know the right answer to start with. I can use a Feynman technique as a perfect effing example of that. <laughs> I'm going to teach the Feynman technique and now I'm learning the Feynman technique better. Well, it's not even a technique. It, that's a misconception. So you may think you're teaching it perfectly, but you were wrong to start with. Sorry, I had to bring right, it up. You're right. I, I thought we were doing really well. We did almost the whole episode without you bringing it up. I thought bringing it up before the episode meant it wasn't going to be in the episode. Yeah, I know, but I, it, it was just a perfect example. <laughs> Stop it. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Um, that, that's, that's explored practice. Uh, and for, for those of you that are curious about like researching any of the stuff that I have mentioned, most of it's going to be in the modes anyway, but skill acquisition, the um, perception action podcast from Rob Gray would be the, the way to go. I'll include a link to that if I remember. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to add? Bye, guys. Because <laughs> you cut me off last time. I will see you. That, 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 that's that's why I gave you the time and the space. Thank you. Thank you. A match. Bye. I'm going to cut you off now. <laughs>